We come now to the book of Lamentations this morning, which was written by Jeremiah, scholars believe, as somewhat of an epilogue to the previous book that bears his name that we just finished studying together, the book of Jeremiah. So Lamentations is somewhat of an epilogue to the story of the book of Jeremiah. It is called Lamentations in our English Bibles because it is a lament. It is a lament about the destruction of Jerusalem which occurred in 586 BC uh, by the Babylonians. And tradition says that Jeremiah wrote Lamentations while sitting in a cave just north of the city of Jerusalem and he wrote Lamentations from this cave as he watched his beloved city burn. And as he wrote Lamentations, he wept. In fact, there are many places throughout Lamentations where it talks about how he wept. And Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet. And for example, in Lamentations 1.16, he writes, This is why I weep, and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. My children are de destitute because the enemy has prevailed. Many other times in this uh, short book of only five chapters, Jeremiah writes about how he weeps. He's just, he's just devastated about the destruction of Jerusalem. The people whom he loves that he's been prophesying to for more than 40 years have not heeded his instruction, his warning, his exhortation. And thus, they're suffering the consequences of their own rebellion and their own sin against God. But nevertheless, he's still destroyed. You know, he's destroyed inside, weeping over his fellow Jewish brothers and sisters and the city that he loves, Jerusalem, uh, being ransacked and destroyed by the Babylonians. The famous artist Rembrandt, in the year 1630, at the young age of 24, it was one of the first uh, pieces of art that he painted, uh, Rembrandt tried to capture this moment of Jeremiah uh, later in his, uh, in his years. Jeremiah, now an older prophet, looking at Jerusalem and, and uh, feeling so um, grieved over its destruction. And so in 1630, Rembrandt uh, painted this picture, which is entitled Jeremiah Lamenting the Destruction of Jerusalem. It depicts an elderly and obviously a very melancholy Jeremiah leaning on the Bible with his left elbow. It's interesting because in, in the, uh, the, the painting, uh, Rembrandt drew in and even labeled Bible. It's probably a reference to the book of Lamentations. So he's leaning, Jeremiah in his old age, leaning with his left elbow on the book of Lamentations. He has some of the articles taken from the temple. And then in the distance here in the artwork, it's kind of hard to make out, but this is this is the temple that's being destroyed. These are soldiers marching into the city. This is the last king, Zedekiah here, uh, the king of Judah before the Babylonians then completely take over the city of Jerusalem. I want you to try to imagine, you know, this guy here, I think Rembrandt captures the emotion here because for 40 years, Jeremiah has been preaching the same warning trying to tell the Jewish people that they need to turn from their idolatry, they need to turn from their sin, they need to get right with God, and they unfortunately turned to deaf ear. And so the, the judgment, the discipline of God came and was fulfilled. And um, Jeremiah had been warning his people that there would be consequences. And now he's writing lamentations uh, about the destruction of the city and the events leading up to this horrific day. But... As Jeremiah laments about this terrible day, he also writes here in Lamentations some familiar verses about the mercy and the compassion and the faithfulness of God. And those verses inspired a famous hymn of our faith entitled, Great is Thy Faithfulness, written in 1923 by Thomas Chisholm. And the idea is that in the midst of all of this sin and depravity and destruction and sorrow, God's mercies and God's compassion are greater still. That's what this book is all about. We're only going to take one Sunday today to look at this. We took like nine months to get through Jeremiah, but this book is only five chapters long. And so this is that central theme that in the midst of all this sin and depravity and devastation and sorrow and destruction, heartache. God's mercies and his compassions are greater still. 
So join me in your Bibles as I read, and then we'll pray. From Lamentations chapter 1, I'm going to read verses 1 through 5, then we'll skip to chapter 3 and also see something from chapter 3. But in chapter 1, verse 1, how deserted lies the city, one so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. She who was queen among the provinces has now become a slave. Bitterly she weeps at night. Tears are upon her cheeks. Among all her lovers there is none to comfort her. All her friends have betrayed her. They have become her enemies. Her affliction and harsh labor, Judah, has gone into exile. She dwells among the nations. She finds no resting place. All who pursue her have overtaken her in the midst of her distress. The roads to Zion mourn, for no one comes to her appointed feasts. All her gateways are desolate. Her priests groan, her maidens grieve, and she is in bitter anguish. Her foes have become her masters. Her enemies are at ease. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Her children have gone into exile, captive before the foe. Now jump over to chapter 3, if you would. And in chapter 3, I'd like to read verses 19 through 24. Verse 19 says, I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them, and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for Him. Little did Jeremiah know that as he would pen these words by inspiration of the Holy Spirit in what tradition says is a cave just north of the city of Jerusalem. Today that cave is called Jeremiah's Grotto and it is situated on the same hill that is also today called Golgotha, the very place where Jesus would lay down his life for the sins of the world. Even as Jeremiah is looking at the destruction of the city because of the sins of the people, and he appeals here in chapter 3 to the compassion and the mercy and the faithfulness of God, 600 years after Jeremiah would write these things, Jesus would bear the sins of the world on that very hill for all of us. You talk about the personification of mercy, compassion, and faithfulness, Jesus Christ dying for the sins of the world. We're going to talk about this today, but first let's pause and pray. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us, and thank you, Lord, for your mercies that are new every morning. Your compassions, they fail not. Great is your faithfulness. We pray, Lord, that we would have eyes to see and a heart that would receive what you would say to us today through the pages of this ancient book. Lord, thank you for your love for us, and thank you for how you died for us, and thank you how you are so compassionate and merciful toward us. May we learn of it today, Lord, or may we be reminded of it as we study through this book today. And we're grateful in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Jewish people today will read the book of Lamentations on what is called on the Jewish calendar the ninth of Av. The month of Av corresponds to our month of August. The reason they read Lamentations on the 9th of Av is because that's the day when the Babylonians came and destroyed Jerusalem in 586 BC. And so the Jewish people never want to forget. And in memoriam to the people and the events of that day, they will read Lamentations, the whole book, only five chapters, on the 9th of Av. But in a Jewish Bible, it is not called Lamentations. In a Jewish Bible, this book is called Echa, and Echa translates how. One single word, how. If you translate the name of this book in a Jewish Bible, it just simply says how, Echa. And the reason why the Jewish people named this book Echa, or how, is because chapters 1, 2, and 4 all begin with that word. If you look at your Bible, do a quick survey with me. Chapter 1, verse 1 here of Lamentations. How, first word of the first verse of the first chapter. How deserted lies the city, one so full of people. How like a widow is she who once was great among the nations. Look at chapter 2, verse 1. 
how the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with the cloud of his anger. And then chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. How the gold has lost its luster, the fine gold become dull. The sacred gems are scattered at the head of every street. How the precious sons of Zion, once worth their weight in gold, are now considered as plots of clay, pots of clay, the work of a potter's hands. And so the word that hangs over the book of Lamentations is how, echa. And it's not a word that begs a question. It's a word that makes an observation. Uh, Jeremiah is making the observation with the word how, basically saying how terrible things have gotten for the Jewish people. How the splendor of the city has vanished. Uh, how the strength of the nation has crumbled, how even the sanity of the people has evaporated. You remember uh, when we were studying through the book of Jeremiah, and again, this is a companion book to Jeremiah, it's basically an epilogue to the book of Jeremiah, but you remember when we were back in Jeremiah that we talked about how the Babylonians engaged in a common ancient warfare called siege warfare, which was basically when an army came against a fortified city, the army attacking that fortified city would encamp around it and then just... You know, it was a game of cat and mouse. They would just wait to see who could withstand the longest before you ran out of food and water. And within the city of Jerusalem, they had a supply of water, thanks to King Hezekiah, who brought the Gihon Spring into the city underneath the walls. But food supply was limited. The book of Jeremiah chapter 39 tells us that the siege went on with the Babylonians for 18 months, hemming in the Jewish people within the city of Jerusalem. So again, the only way that you would win in siege warfare is who could withstand the longest had the, the, the greatest food supply. If you had the greatest food supply inside the city, then eventually the army, if they, as they ran out of supplies, the attacking army, they would just leave. They'd give up. But on the other end, if within the city, because food supplies and shipments and any kind of you know, inventory would, would not be replenished because the attacking army has cut off all supplies coming into the city, if you ran out of food, you'd give up and surrender. That was siege warfare. Jeremiah 39 says that for 18 months, the Babylonians held the Jewish people as prisoners within their own city until they ran out of food. And then the people of Jerusalem do the unthinkable. And Jeremiah records it in chapter 4, verse 10. Look in your Bibles at chapter 4, verse 10. After 18 long months and the food supply now depleted, Lamentations 4, verse 10 gives us a picture of just how low the conditions had sunk. Lamentations 4, 10 says, With their own hands... Compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food when my people were destroyed. It's a terrible image, but we need to understand the environment, the situation, the circumstances surrounding all of this. You get the idea of why the Jews named this book, How? Because it's about how terrible and how unimaginable things got for the Jewish people when the Babylonians besieged Jerusalem. And the sad truth is, it didn't have to get this bad. If the Babylonians had heeded the warnings of Jeremiah and the other prophets, they would have been spared all of this devastation, all of this destruction. But in rebellion against God, the Jewish people decided we like our idols, we like our lives without God. And so they continued to live this way year after year after year until eventually it caught up with them. And so in addition to the word how, we need to ask the question with the word why. Why did this happen? And there's no mystery to this. The answer to why all this happened, all this terrible devastation and destruction is because again, the Jewish people brought it on themselves as a result of their sin, their disobedience to God. It's given to us over and over again through this short little letter. You don't need to turn there, but I'll quote Lamentations 1.5. The Lord has brought her grief because of her many sins. Lamentations 1.22. 
You have dealt with me because of all my sins. Lamentations 3.39. Why should any living man complain when punished for his sins? Friends, we need to understand there are consequences from sin. Sometimes devastating consequences. And Lamentations is a book that serves to be a reminder for us that sin carries with it a heavy weight, a heavy weight of sorrow and grief and shame and misery. Oh, it may not be immediate. It wasn't immediate with the Jewish people. They, they managed to get away with their sin for 40 long years while they continued to turn a deaf ear to Jeremiah. For 40 years, he kept preaching to them, warning to them, telling them what was going to happen if they didn't turn. And so, immediately they didn't experience the misery and the devastation and the heavy consequences and the sorrow, but eventually, which is true for all of us, all of us will eventually experience the devastation of our sin if we don't get right with God. That's what this book should remind us about. Eventually, the consequences of sin catch up with us. We may not experience it at the moment, but eventually, it always catches up with us. This is Galatians 6, 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. Whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. We will end up feeling and experiencing some measure of consequence for our sins if we don't turn to God. We can only sin against God for so long before we become completely miserable in our sin. We read, for example, here in Lamentations 1, verse 20. He says, See, O Lord, how distressed I am. I am in torment within, and in my heart I am disturbed, for I have been most rebellious. Now, Jeremiah is not writing for himself. He's writing in the first person because he's, he's feeling on behalf of the Jewish people, his own people. He was a righteous man, a righteous prophet, but he's writing here in terms of this is how it feels when you are distant from God, when you're not right with God. It's devastating. It causes distress. He says, I'm tormented within. My heart is disturbed. We also read in chapter 5, verses 15 and 16, joy is gone from our hearts. Our dancing has turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe to us, for we have sinned. And this is the description of a life that is not right with God. Distressed, tormented in your heart. The joy is gone because sin has taken its toll. And if you can relate to some of that, if you're here today and you're like, yeah, I, I get that, and you'd be honest with yourself and with God and say, you know, I'm not right with God, and as a result, my heart's heavy, my life's a mess, I'm feeling distressed, I'm, I'm, I'm feeling like, you know, there's no real joy in my life. I want you to listen today. I want you to understand the scene that is happening here, because this scene that is playing out 2,600 years ago is the same scene that plays out in human lives today. When you're not right with God, you feel it, don't you? It doesn't feel good. And yet, in the middle of all of this, and you should go home and read if you, if you really want, you know, some heaviness. You can go home and read all five chapters to really get the idea of just the weight of this, the sorrow, the devastation, the destruction, because in the middle of all of that is chapter 3, where there's this insertion intentionally to remind us about God's compassion, love, mercy, and faithfulness. Go back to chapter 3. Because I want you to notice right in the middle of this book, I mean exactly in the middle, there's a chapter and a, two chapters and a half in front of it, two chapters and a half behind it. You have here in chapter 3 of Lamentation from verses 19 through 24, you have right in the middle of this misery, this message of hope. Now, Jeremiah first describes how bitter life is without God before he gets to the hopeful part. So don't check out. We're going to get to the hopeful part. But I first need you to see verses 19 and 20 with me. So in chapter 3, verses 19 and 20, this is what he writes. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them and my soul is downcast 
within me. Now, again, it's not that Jeremiah is sinning. He's a prophet who's righteous. But he writes in the first person for those who are not right with God and who feel the misery of their situation. And one of the first things he says here in verse 19, first part of verse 19, he says, I remember my affliction and my wandering. I remember my affliction and my wandering. When you're not right with God, you feel afflicted in your soul, don't you? There's this, there's this affliction that you can just feel down deep, like something's not right. You almost, like you feel ill. And he adds there, I remember my affliction and my wandering. It's very interesting. You can start to feel like you're just wandering aimlessly without direction or purpose when you're distant from God. When you're not right with God, just everything is off kilter and you don't even feel like you have direction and clarity and like you're just wandering. And, and people who are very successful without Christ can describe their lives this way too. I, I remember reading once a quote from Simon Cowell who's well known for you know, American Idol, X Factor, record executive, television producer worth a few hundred millions of dollars and makes no profession of faith in Christ. And I, I, I lifted this quote, he said one time, quote, I get very dark moods for no reason. I'm just a wandering asteroid. Listen to that language. I'm just a wandering asteroid without a home. I get to points in my life where I sometimes think I'm never going to be happy, end quote. This is a life that is distant from God. I remember my affliction and my wandering and then he also says there in verse 19, and I remember the bitterness and the gall. These are basically two words expressing the same feeling because gall is a plant from which is derived bitterness. And so it's bitterness upon bitterness here. He's saying that sin makes us sour because we become bitter about life, bitter about people, bitter about God. When things don't go well for us because we're distant from God, we can tend to be Bitter, when we live in disobedience to God, it produces this, just this sourness in our heart. Jeremiah writes about it. I remember my bitterness and the gall. And in verse 20, he says, and my soul is downcast within me. Sin can take a person to a very dark place. It can be very gloomy and very dark when you're disobedient to God. Because the natural result of sin is guilt. And the natural result of guilt is shame. And the natural result of shame is feeling downcast and depressed. And in addition, when you start to withdraw from God because you're disobedient to Him, you can begin to feel an isolation of the soul. And great loneliness kicks in on top of the downcast, discouragement, depression that you might feel. This is the nature of sin. And then here's what people typically do. Because they're in disobedience to God, instead of doing what could be the remedy to it all, getting right with God, confessing your sin, receiving His forgiveness, here's what people tend to do. They don't like feeling discouraged, downcast, or depressed, so they just start to self-medicate. They just start to self-medicate. A little bit of weed, a couple of drinks. It's only to unwind. It's all good. But no, in the end, it just leads to a vicious cycle of trying to numb the pain. But it never really cures the condition of why in the first place you feel so downcast because that's the nature of sin that is unrepented and when you don't get right with god it becomes this heaviness this dark place this gloominess and let me just say to you if you can relate to anything i'm saying here this morning if this describes you in the least little bit i want you to listen very carefully to the next part of this passage verses 21 through 23 as jeremiah writes yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have what? Hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Great is your faithfulness, God. Your love and your mercy and your compassions. They're new every morning here. In the midst of all the affliction and wandering and bitterness and gall and a downcast soul caused by sin, Jeremiah writes here how he clings to the character of God. He appeals to the mercy of God, the love of God, the compassion of God, the faithfulness of God. And there is a God who is full of compassion, love, and mercy who is faithful to us. 
and who will meet us in that darkest place where sin takes us. This is the hope right in the middle of all this gloom and doom, of all this sorrow and destruction as the result of sin. God just explodes off the pages of Lamentations chapter 3 through the pen of Jeremiah. He says, I want you to know that in the midst of all of this mess and even cannibalism and just the horror of what happens when people just take a nosedive because of sin and disobedience to God, God shows up. And in his mercy and in his compassion, he is faithful. And it's new every single morning. This is our hope. Amen. This is our hope. He emphasizes three aspects of the character and nature of God as our hope. The first is God's great love. Now, some of your Bibles translate love as mercy. It's the Hebrew word chesed. Chesed is often translated mercy, so it can be used interchangeably. Love, mercy, kindness. That's what chesed can mean. And the first thing he notes here is God's great love for us. God is a loving, merciful God. In Psalm 103, 10 to 11, aren't you glad about this? It says, He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His love for those who fear Him. God's love is great for us. It is immeasurable for us. He is a loving, merciful God, abounding in love. And then he emphasizes here also God's great compassion. God is a compassionate God. Psalm 103 verse 8 says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. God is a compassionate God. David, when he sinned, committing adultery with Bathsheba, then he was confronted by the prophet Nathan. After, after David humbled himself, he wrote Psalm 51. And one of the first things he appeals to with God is God's mercy and then God's compassion. Listen to Psalm 51, verses 1 and 2. David cries out, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. Because of God's great love, His mercy, because of God's great compassion, this is our hope. And then Jeremiah also adds here as part of this verse, God's great faithfulness. The Bible tells us in Psalm 145, verse 13, that the Lord is faithful to all His promises and loving towards all He has made. And in Psalm 36, verse 5, it says, Your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. In other words, David was writing there saying, God's faithfulness is immeasurable. You, it's boundless. You can't contain it. He is faithful to us in ways we don't deserve it, but He is faithful in all His ways concerning us. And then, check this out. Don't miss this part of verse 23, because it's the most important part to all of this, where Jeremiah emphasizes that all these things, meaning His love, His mercy, His compassion, and faithfulness, they are new every single morning. Every single morning. When you got up today, there was a whole new fresh batch of God's love, mercy, compassion, and faithfulness for you. Every single morning of your day. It's enough to make you want to get up every day. Because when you think about what yesterday was, well, praise God, at least tomorrow I'm going to get a new batch of His faithfulness and His love and His mercy. So I'm going to wake up in the morning thankful. Oh, David would write in Psalm 143, verse 8, let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Let the morning bring me word of your unfailing love. Friends, this is the character and nature of our God. He is compassionate. He is merciful. He is compassionate. His compassion never fails. Great is His faithfulness. And some of you need to receive this today. Because you've been carrying around a lot of shame, a lot of guilt. Your soul is downcast. 
You would describe yourself perhaps similarly, that there's been a bitterness of your soul, you feel afflicted, you know you're not right with God. This is the nature of sin. But here's the good news in the midst of all of this that is extended even unto us today out of the pages of Lamentations chapter 3. God's mercy and His compassions, they never fail. Great is His faithfulness. And today is a new day for you to receive that mercy, love, and compassion from God. You say, well, Pastor Gary, you don't know what I did yesterday. You don't know what I did last year. I don't need to know. His mercies and compassion and faithfulness are new every single morning. Every single morning. You say, yeah, but I did something 20, 30 years ago. Nobody even knows about. It's okay. His mercies are new every single morning. Today is a new day for you to receive His compassion, His love, and His mercy. I don't want you leaving here today carrying the same shame and guilt you came in with. Now, you can choose to, but I beg you, come to the altar today and receive the boundless supply of the love, compassion, mercy, and faithfulness of God. In just a minute, the worship team's going to come back here. And we're going to sing this good hymn of our faith, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And when we sing this hymn, as soon as we start to sing it, I'm going to ask you, if you today want to get right with God and want, want Him to just take from you the weight of the shame, you're among friends. You're among friends. I'm going to invite you in a moment to get out of your seat and come stand down here. People will applaud you, trust me. No judgment here. This is a day of receiving the mercy of God, to receive the love of God, the compassion of our Father in heaven, to experience the faithfulness of God in your life. And for as many people as are standing down here, I'm going to lead you in a single word of prayer to invite Christ to come into your life and just make you a brand new person. God's in the business of making miserable people brand new brand new but you're gonna to have to want it nobody's gonna twist your arm you could leave here if you choose sadly you could leave here as miserably as you came if in fact sin has been causing some misery in your life or you can make a decision when we start singing this hymn I can get out of my seat today because I'm tired of being sick and tired and I just want to get right with God I just want to experience his love his mercy his compassion his forgiveness so I'm going to try to make it easy for everybody who wants to make a decision to walk forward by asking everybody to please stand. Would you please? Everybody stand. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you that your mercies are new with every morning. Your compassions, they fail not. Great is your faithfulness. Today is a new day, Lord. And there's some people here, no doubt, who need to know today is a new day. They can have a fresh start. They can leave here different than they came in. All because of you, Lord. Because you are a God of mercy. You are a God of love. You are a God of compassion. You forgive us. You're ready to meet us here today. I pray right now you'd put it on the hearts of men, women, and young people to make it out of their seats and come down here and stand here, Lord. For your sake and for their sake, that you would move in their lives in a brand new way today, that they can leave here knowing they've experienced the love, mercy, forgiveness, and compassion of a Father in heaven who sent his son Jesus to die on a cross for us. So we can leave here brand new people, Lord. I pray right now that the enemy would not whisper into somebody's ear that they don't need Jesus, Lord. We all need you. We're all sinners saved by grace. We are desperate for you. Thank you that you're compassionate and merciful and loving and forgiving. Move in our midst now, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We're going to sing this as we sing it. Start coming. Just start walking. Don't be ashamed. Don't be embarrassed. Come on. Come on down here. Let's sing this. Great is thy faithfulness, O oh God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, the forever will be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by 
morning new mercies I see all I have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness Lord unto me summer and winter and springtime and harvest sun moon and stars in their courses above join with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness mercy and come on love. sing it you all come great is thy faithfulness great is thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand i provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me god is a faithful god i praise the lord let's let's praise the lord for these who are standing down here I'm going to wait just a few more seconds if anybody else is on the fence because I don't want to pray with them and leave you out. If you want to receive today God's mercy, compassion, His love, His forgiveness. Come on. God bless you. Come on. Come on. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come on. God bless you. God bless you. Come on. God is a faithful God. Jesus died on the cross for all our sins. And his mercies are new with every single morning. And his compassions, they never fail. Great is his faithfulness. I'm going to lead out in a word of prayer, and I'm going to ask every single one of you to pray this prayer with me out loud. I'm going to go slowly enough so you can repeat it after me, but I just want you to make this your profession of faith so that you can just receive today the love and mercy of God expressed to us on a cross 2,000 years ago by Jesus Christ, and just receive his love and receive his forgiveness today. Just receive it. It's given to you freely as a gift. So pray this prayer with me out loud. Just bow your heads. Pray this with me out loud. Just be bold about it. Just say this. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus I, thank I thank you that you died on a cross for my sins. And today is a new day for me. I surrender my life to you. I pray that you would forgive me and that you'd come into my life as Lord and Savior. I receive your love today. I receive your mercy, your compassion. And this day is a new beginning for me through faith in Jesus Christ, in whose name I pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God praise today. Thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord.